to talk to you today about being jealous and Saul's envy and Saul's jealousy. So turn to 1 Samuel chapter 18. If you're new today, we're walking through the book of 1 Samuel, looking at some of the big stories of the book of 1 Samuel. And in 1 Samuel 18, something pretty remarkable, pretty profound happens in 1 Samuel 18, a shift in the relationship between King Saul, who's the king of Israel at this time, and a young upstart, a young hero has emerged in the nation. His name is David. He was a shepherd. He was uh, ruddy and uh, really not that important. And suddenly he burst onto the scene when the prophet Samuel pours oil on him and anoints him the next king. Then he shows up at the epic battle and defeats Goliath. And suddenly he's welcomed into the king's court and he's becoming a bit of a rock star. I mean, he's kind of a, go, Twitter's going nuts about him at this point. Hashtag next big thing. It's a big deal about David. And something happens after a battle with the Philistines. And we're going to pick up this story when Saul, the man in power, is suddenly threatened by a young, talented leader that God's hand is obviously on. All right, you ready to read this story? It's really a great story. 1 Samuel 18, verse 5. It says, whatever Saul sent him to do, David did it so successfully that Saul gave him a high rank in the army. And this pleased everybody, all the people, Saul's officers. So everybody's excited because David's doing good work. Just stop here just for a moment. I suspect there are some of you who were doing good work, showing up on time, doing your work, being faithful, being diligent, with good motives, good attitudes, and then suddenly somebody started getting mad at you, so angry at you, trying to sabotage you, uh, not working alongside you. Suddenly something happened in your relationship between you and another person. You have no idea what caused all this. This is David, okay? Because David is just doing good work. Think about David just for a moment. He was just minding his father's sheep, mind, doing his work. And suddenly he gets called into the front yard where Samuel, the prophet of God, pours oil on his head. David's not looking to be king. He wasn't asking to be king. He wasn't running for any election, but he gets oil poured on his head. People tell him he's gonna be the next king. He didn't go to the battle to defeat Goliath. He's bringing sandwiches to his brothers meat and cheese, and, and, and suddenly he sees this giant across the valley yelling at the army, and he decides, oh, I'll go out there and take care of this. So he goes out there, not looking for any fame or any fortune, and he defeats Goliath. Suddenly the king welcomes him into his house. He's done nothing wrong up to this point. He's had good motives. He's had pure motives. He's, had, he's doing the right thing for the right reason. Would all of you agree with that, okay? Would you agree with that? All right. But when the men were returning home <clears throat> after David had killed the Philistine, the women came out from among the towns of Israel to meet King Saul with singing and dancing. I want to just stop just for a moment because I, I know this is the 21st century. This may sound a little misogynist. It's not at all, okay? I think that men uh, really believe that what women say about them are impor is important. I'm gonna just say all the married men in the room, you would agree with this. When your wife really sincerely is proud of you, there's not much better feeling than that. When Pam is proud of me, and as y'all know, sometimes Pam's just trying to encourage me. Pam's trying to help me with my feelings. If, but there are times when Pam really looks at me and says, you are doing well. And honestly, she can buy me gifts, she can cook a meal, but those words, <clears throat> those words actually empower me to be a better man more than anything else she does in my life. And this is true about the, 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 between men and women, our words to one another can inspire or contradict and harm. So women, these women are walking out, greeting the men as they're coming back from battle and with singing and dancing. By the way, singing and dancing always helps everything. And I don't care how bad the song is, if you can sing and dance, it helps, right? So if they're singing and dancing with joyful songs and with tambourines and lutes, it's like new life worship greeting you every day when you come home from work. Think about this, John Egan in your driveway just singing a worship song for you as you're coming home from work. This is a good day. As they danced, 
they sang this song. I don't know where they came up with this song, who wrote the song, but they sing it out loud for everyone to hear. They said, Saul has slain his thousands. Now, by the way, that's a pretty good day. That's not a bad thing. But then they say, David, though, his tens of thousands. In other words, I want you to notice here that they compare one person against another. And the first step in us becoming jealous of one another is that when someone begins to compare the good thing that God's doing in my life, when they compare it with the good thing God's doing in someone else's life, and the numbers don't add up. This is true. This is 21st century stuff we're talking about today. When my life that is blessed by God, would you agree, let's just stop here for a moment, would you agree that Saul killing thousands is a blessed life? Yeah, yes, the answer is yes. So come out, you can talk in church here, okay? So the answer is yes. Would you also agree that David killing tens of thousands was blessing? Yes, it's just two different types of blessings. And listen to this, Saul, when he heard the comparison between his life and the life of a young upstart, he was angry. And this refrain galled him. He said, they've credited David with tens of thousands, but with me only thousands. What more can he get but the kingdom? And yeah, actually, he would get the kingdom. Self-fulfilling prophecy, right? Verse 9. And from that time on, from that moment, the moment of comparison is where all this starts. From that time on, when, when people begin to compare Saul and David, Saul kept a jealous eye on David. Or he gets worse. The next day, this evil spirit from God came forcefully upon Saul. He was prophesying in his house while David was playing the harp. All right, just stop just for a moment. Not only is David willing to go out and do battle for this guy, risk his life, I mean, David was going out risking his life in battle for this guy. And then when he got home, he would play the harp for him. Nothing in David's life, nothing in David's demeanor shows that David was competing or trying to take something from Saul. In every instance that we see in this story, David's trying to serve. He's trying to be a blessing. He's trying to do good things. The next day, an evil spirit from God came forcefully upon Saul. He was prophesying. David's playing the harp as he usually did. And Saul had a spear in his hand. And he hurled it, saying to himself, he's having self-talk. He's thinking to himself, I'll pin David to the wall. And David eluded him twice. Let me just stop. If you throw a spear at me one time, it's game over. You won't get a second shot. You're not going to get a second chance at this. This again, though, shows you the extravagant links that David was willing to go to to help the relationship. He's getting spears thrown at him. And he wasn't just playing around. He's trying to kill him. And David keeps coming back, keeps coming back trying to help this relationship. I want you to see the progression in this story of how envy and jealousy stirred in the heart of Saul. Three things happened, and these same three things are playing out in our lives almost every day. Number one, he heard something. He heard the women singing. He, he heard people comparing himself to David. He saw something on social media that made his life feel less than the life of another person. Don't get quiet on me here this morning, all right? How many of you, and this confession's good for our soul, how many of you have seen another family's photos on social media and your first thought was, their life is better than my life? Come on, raise your hand. Like eight, eight honest souls in the room, and that's all I needed to move forward, okay? You know what the, the problem with social media is, is that it's really the highlight reel and not the day-to-day -day existence of our lives. If you really saw my life, if I were like to post every 10 minutes, you would be bored out of your mind. It is awful. It's not that exciting. Yes, I was in London last week, but I worked really hard and went to bed really early and did nothing that interesting except work. And say, so, yet yeah, people see the highlight reels of your life and they start comparing your life with my life and it doesn't seem like my life is working out. 
And your first response when you hear this can be this. You can become angry about it. He heard something and Saul got mad. Saul became angry. So let me ask you a question. When you happen upon someone's social media post and they're just having the best Saturday of all time, but you're with your cat and your jammy still, I mean, let me just ask you a question. They're out having, they've already hiked a 10-mile hike and petted a deer and gone to the great restaurant and you are still in your jammies and your cat's in your lap. Let me ask you a question. Are you mad about that? I know what, I watch you. Listen, Facebook is my, is the best material for messages because I follow all of you on Facebook. And I appreciate the content you're giving me for these sermons every Sunday. I mean, so he becomes angry. He's mad. He gets upset about it. I wonder if Saul, I wonder what would have happened different in this story. If Saul had heard that song, Saul is killing his thousands. David is killing his tens of thousands. I wonder how this narrative would have changed if Saul had said, thank God for the young men that the Lord is raising up inside this nation. Oh, thank God. I'm not having to carry the weight of responsibility by myself. Praise be to God that David has answered the call that's on his life. And I'm so remarkably proud of this young man who is seeing such success come to him. And you know what? David has done nothing but serve me and serve me well. And what a joy it will be to grow old with young men such as this, walking alongside me, helping me, doing hard work with me. What a joy it's going to be to see David grow into the great man that God is obviously going to make him become. How awesome is this that we have young men who have run past me, who are doing better things than me, who are accomplishing greater things than me. I wonder how the narrative would have changed if Saul had responded in a godly way toward David. I wonder how David's life would have changed. I wonder how Saul's life would have changed. I wonder how the nation of Israel would have been blessed if Saul had only dealt with the jealousy that was brewing up in his heart, the sin of envy in comparison. So he heard something, he became angry, and that caused him to throw a spear. You see, a lot of you are wondering why your relationships are getting sabotaged. And it might be that someone, they're just insanely jealous of the blessings of the Lord on your life. Or it may be that you're throwing spears because you somewhere along the line believe that God's blessing someone better than you and it makes you angry. But we have to deal with the emotion of anger. If you don't deal with it quickly, if you don't recognize the, the work of the enemy in your life, this jealousy can literally cause you to have murderous thoughts. You know the first murder in the Bible was because of jealousy? Cain and Abel, the first, the brothers in the very first pages of your Bible, the first murder in the Bible was because God was blessing the sacrificial offerings of Abel but not those of Cain. And Cain could not see the blessings of God because he was giving part of his fruits to the Lord. But Abel was giving the first fruits to God and the blessing of the Lord came upon Abel differently than it was coming upon Cain. And Cain saw that, became angry and killed his brother as a result of this. Look at, uh, so here's the three progressions. What we see or hear turns into what we feel. So we see or hear something. See, see or hear. See or hear something. And then we feel something. We feel this emotion. What are you feeling when you hear the good reports of others? What do we see? We see something and we hear something. We feel something and then we do something. We respond to it. And listen, if you allow anger to fester in your heart, it will come out. You, it will surface, it will blow up, it will explode out of your life. What we see, what we hear, what we feel, what we do. All right, here's what happens. Let me just get it down really practical. I don't think we have any murderous thoughts going on in the room probably. But here, you may tell you a scenario that plays out in my life. Okay, let me confess first. I'm around a lot of pastors, a lot of my friends are pastors, a lot of us pastor churches together, and several times a year we'll get together and pastors are notorious for bragging about their churches. I brag about you, I brag about new life, I love what God's doing here. But when I get around pastors, a lot of times some insecurities might surface in me. And so one pastor may say to me, oh Brady, you wouldn't believe what God's doing in my church, and he tells me this great story. And the whole time I'm hearing the story, my thought is, I have a better story that I'm gonna tell you when you're finished, and the reason it's better is because it involves me. <laughs> it 
It's like arguing with an astronaut. No matter what you say, he can say to you, yeah, but I landed on the moon. Have you heard Brian Regan, the Brian Regan comedian, tell this? This is worth YouTube. This, uh, listen to his man on the moon bit about arguing with astronauts. Because they can always trump your story. They always have a better story. Yeah, but I've been in outer space. I've landed on the moon. What have you done? And this is what we do. Think about how many times you've heard someone brag and tell about what God's blessing in your life. And your immediate response is to tell a better story to them about you. And this is what was going on in Saul's heart. He could not celebrate the success of David. He wanted to be the guy who had the tens of thousands. He wanted to have the better story. And you're saying, well, Pastor Brady, this is such a nice little Sunday school self-help lesson. Thank you for sharing this with us. I know that we learned all this in kindergarten. What's the big deal? Let me show you what the big deal is. James chapter three, this is a James who is the half-brother of Jesus. Now you think about the half-brother of Jesus. How many people were jealous of James? He grew up with Jesus. He saw Jesus when no one else saw him. Jesus raised James' dog back from the dead and couldn't tell anyone. He knew all these stories, you know? All these stories that James knew about Jesus. And then suddenly, not only is James the half-brother of Jesus, he becomes the leader of the biggest church in the world at the time, the, the church of Jerusalem. So can you imagine James, the jealousy that people had toward him? He's the leader of the biggest church in the world at the time. He's the half-brother of Jesus. So if anyone knew how to deal with this issue, I think it was James. And James 3 says something really sobering. Look at this, verse 14. He says, but if you harbor bitter envy and selfish ambition. Now let's stop here for a moment because I want you to see this word harbor. Harbor is a word that means that you, you linger there. When a boat goes to a harbor, it's there for a while. It puts down an anchor. A harbor is where ships stay. A harbor is where ships linger. Ships don't sail through harbors. Ships sail into harbors to stay there for a while, to get refueled, to get replenished, to get repairs. They're not moving on very quickly. So when, he, when the writer of this book is telling this story, he's saying, when you feel these feelings of jealousy, when you harbor them, when you allow them to put down anchor, when you allow them to stay there for a while, he says, don't boast about it or deny the truth. You better deal with it. Such wisdom, and he's puts the, the hashtags here, does not come down from heaven. This is not, in other words, it may feel good. It may sound like wisdom, but it's not wisdom. He says, it is unearthly, listen to James here, okay? It is unearthly, it is unspiritual, and then he gets really honest. It's of the devil. I read that this week and I went, this is sobering. He says, for where you have envy and selfish ambition, when everything's about you, when you can't stand it when someone else is succeeding more than you, he says, when you get to that place in your life, this is James talking, not me, you will find disorder and every evil practice. That's amazing, that's a text that we better pay attention to. In other words, here's what he was saying. He's saying jealousy is literally a door that we can open, a door into your life into your soul, into your emotions. It's a door that invites the enemy into your life. It's literally like standing at your house and three in the morning, some shady characters are, are casing your neighborhood. It's literally like opening the door and going, hey, are y'all looking to steal something? Because I got some good stuff in here that's easy to steal. Now I'll just let, come, come right on here. I won't call the police. You can come in. I'll pile it up for you right here. Y'all come take my stuff. This is what's happening. When we harbor these thoughts, when we don't get rid of jealous thoughts, it's literally like opening the door of your house and saying, come on in, evil one. Do whatever you want in my life. Just like that is how we go from just being a little envious, oh man, I wish my life was like that, to literally wanting to destroy someone's personality and put harm to them. 
Saul went from victorious king, coming back to the city, I'm victorious, we just beat up the Philistines. He went from joyous king to murderous tyrant, just like that, because he did not deal with the issues of his heart. All right, so how do we know if we're jealous, all right? How do you know? Because obviously, it's everyone else in the room but you. So, but, but I want you to be able to help the rest of the people, okay? So I'm gonna give you some questions to answer. How, how do we know if everyone else is jealous? No, I didn't, the reason I phrased the question like this, I want you to write this question down. We. How do we know if we are jealous? Now, right, here's the first question. Can I really celebrate when they're successful? Are you quick to celebrate? You know, you know who the, the real victim in this story is? David got a, a, a spear thrown at him. But you know, Jonathan is the one that should have been angry about this whole thing. Jonathan was the son of Saul and he was in line to be the next king. And when Samuel the prophet poured oil on David's head and anointed David to be king, it meant that Saul's time was about to be up, but it also meant that Jonathan would never be king. The young man, Jonathan, his dad was the king. In other words, there was a certain sense of entitlement that came to the firstborn sons in the line of kingship. So if, if Saul is the king, Jonathan is the son, Jonathan's gonna be the next king. That was a reasonable, uh, reasonable conclusion to come to. Suddenly, Jonathan's future got derailed by this young guy that came onto the scene. But I want you to notice the difference between Jonathan's response and Saul's response. In verse three, I re we started reading at verse five, but if you wanna go back to verse three, it says, Jonathan made a covenant with David because he loved him as himself. Jonathan chose to see God's work in David and celebrate it. And they actually became lifelong friends. They became covenant brothers, a friendship that would save both of their lives on multiple times in the future. It would, instead of Jonathan sabotaging the call of God on David's life, Jonathan celebrated the call of God on David's life. And because of that, when we talk about Jonathan now, we talk about this best friend, this covenant brother, a friend who is closer than a, than a brother even. Jonathan, the covenant man, the man who understood the power of relationship. Jonathan, the one who was not willing to sabotage a friendship for the sake of his jealousy. And envy is the sin of comparison. Jonathan could have compared his life with David's life. David was gonna get the castle and he was gonna get the second biggest house in town. But it was never enough. You see, what the root of this, if we pulled up the root of jealousy out of the ground of our lives right now, here's what's really going on. Jealousy is a belief that God has not blessed us as we deserve. I was just thinking this morning how blessed I am. My daughter, who's right there, she's running the camera, waving at me. Everybody wave at Callie, she's waving. I have an 18-year-old daughter that could be anywhere in the world right now. She says she's filming her fat dad preaching. <laughs> I told her to use the skinny lens and she's not, she's not doing that for me. During worship, I look back there and my 20-year-old son is worshiping his face off in the choir. My daughter's running the camera. And my wife, who I love and adore, sitting beside me. Listen, if nothing else happens in my life, if every book I write collapses, if everything I try from this point on fails miserably, I am blessed. And it has, at some point, it has to be enough. Listen, at some point in your life, at some point in all of our lives, we have to stop competing. We have to stop comparing and we have to say thank you because if you don't learn to say thank you, then what's happening in your life now will never be enough. You'll never make enough money. You'll never live in a house that's big enough. You'll never have a job that's important enough. You'll never be successful enough until you stop and say, thank you, God. Thank you, God, for all you've done in my life and the blessings you've given me are enough. They're enough. If you don't bless me with one more thing in my life, what you've blessed me with up to this point 
will satisfy me for another generation. Can somebody say amen to this? Are you catching this this morning? And so, which leads me to the second question that I wanna ask. Does someone always have to lose in order for me to win? Can you really celebrate someone else? Can you really cheer them on even when it means your life is not as great right now? And can you, does someone always have to lose? Why are we so competitive? And I understand life is a competition. Don't send me any of your emails, I understand that. I am more competitive than anyone in this room. I've won state championships, I've coached in national titles, I know what sports is about. And I've never told you those stories, but I will one day when I feel more braggadocious. I'm just telling you, I know how to compete. But the kingdom of heaven is not about someone losing so that I can win. The kingdom of heaven is actually more about all of us flourishing. And this is why, listen to Proverbs 24, verse 17. He says, do not gloat when your enemy falls. Don't gloat about it. That's not the kingdom of heaven. When he stumbles, do not let your heart rejoice. When someone else's perfect life falls apart, we should not gloat over that. We should mourn over that. Because one day your perfect life may fall apart. And you're going to want someone who will stand with you and not gloat about it. I think we get what we pay for. I think when I celebrate other people, people will celebrate me. You know, we all just cheered a minute ago when John Egan's album popped up, and we're all, celebra- we're all excited about the project. You know what, who we were really clapping for? John Egan, because he stands here every Sunday, and he doesn't tell you about all the stuff that he gets to do. He just selflessly serves us in worship. So now when we get to selflessly cheer for him when he has a project, we go, yes! Here's a guy that stood here and leads us and serves us and leads us so well. Sunday after Sunday, now he's got this project coming out. Of course I want to celebrate that. Of course we celebrate. Yes. Last Sunday, I was in the UK. I was in, I spoke at two different places on Sunday morning. So at one o'clock in the morning, this time, your time, I was up and at them, preaching in two different cities, two different locations. Went to a long lunch with a group of leaders and then I went straight from there to another leadership meeting that I led for two hours where we taught and did Q&A with about 40 of the real key leaders in this church. And so by five or six o'clock London time, they dropped me off at the hotel and I was gonna fly home the next day. I'm exhausted, tired, jet lag. I've worked, I put in my time that day. I was about to fall, I was about to fall out of my, I was just tired. (laughs) And I knew that this service, I could watch it online live. So I, I actually got in my hotel room just in time to click it on. And there's our worship team, they're leading. And man, the Holy Spirit, you can feel the Holy Spirit come off my iPad so much. I was so enjoying just sitting in my room, refreshing my soul, listening to them sing songs. Pastor Stephanie came up and did ministry. It was a powerful moment. I could feel it. And then suddenly Andrew gets up, Pastor Andrew gets up and preaches the best sermon on David and Goliath I have ever heard in my life. I'm being sincere. It was the best sermon on David and Goliath. And I've heard a thousand sermons on David and Goliath and it was the best I've ever heard. And I'm sitting there listening to all of this. And I was so grateful that God has surrounded us with such remarkable people to do ministry with here. I didn't feel any guilt for being gone. I didn't feel any comp- competition for Andrew preaching better than me. I didn't, feel, I didn't feel any of that. And I was so grateful that my heart was cheering for them. Go, 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 go. Yes, preach it better. Yes. That was amazing. And I clicked off and I went, thanks, God. thanks, Lord, for this team, for this church, this great church that we get to be a part of, this great group of people that we get to live alongside. You see, this is a test for all of us. Can we really, really be happy for other people? Can we celebrate it when someone else is doing really, really well? And when you do, let me tell you what happens. When you, here's three things. When you promote others, you will get promoted. Here's three things I want you to write down. Promote others. Because when you do, God will promote you. Cheer for others. 
Celebrate when others succeed. Make it a normal part of your life to write thank you notes, to send someone a note. Get, don't get on Facebook and criticize. Get on Facebook and encourage. Speak life. And when you speak life to other people, life gets spoken back into you. When you cheer for other people, people the crowd begins to cheer for you. This is how the kingdom of heaven is run. This is the economy of heaven, by the way. And be content and thankful. Is Jesus and what he's doing in your life right now, is it enough? If everything were to be stripped away from your life and you were left alone with you and Jesus, would that be enough for right now? Would it be enough? It's enough for me. It's enough. All is well with my soul. All is well between me and the Lord is maybe the most powerful thing we can say. All is well. Would you stand with me this morning? We're gonna come to the Lord's table. Those of you who serve, would you come forward and be prepared to serve at the Lord's table? You know what I love about coming to the Lord's table is that it evens the ground with all of us. I don't have a tray of juice and a thing of bread for those of you whose lives are really amazing right now. And then for all of you that are having amazing lives, come over here. For all of you that feel like you're really having a hard time, come here. No, the tray's the same. The bread's the same, the cup's the same. And it's been like that for 2,000 years in church history where everyone comes to the same table. And what it does is it reminds us that Jesus is enough for all of us and that Jesus is the same for all of us. Whether you're grieving right now or celebrating right now or something in between, Jesus is enough for us today. And so we come to the bread and come to the cup today to receive the sufficiency of Jesus, to declare that Christ alone is enough for our lives. That while everything in the world may come and go, while may the successes may come and go, while there are days we're gonna feel successful and other days we're not, at the end of the day, Jesus is sufficient for us and he is enough for us. That's what the table of the Lord reminds us this morning. I'm gonna read this passage of scripture to you just out of uh, 1 Corinthians 13, one of the most misunderstood chapters in the Bible because we think it's only for weddings. But actually, Paul, when he wrote 1 Corinthians 13, didn't write this so we'd have some, you know, pithy things to say at weddings. He actually wrote it to the church to remind the church of how to love one another. Did you know that? This is actually a letter to the church saying this is how you should love one another. All of us. So I want to read this. Would you just read it out loud? It's a great confession. And it recenters us. It reorganizes us. It unravels us. And, and, and it brings us back into order when we read these kinds of passages. 1 Corinthians 13, read it out loud with me if you like. Love is patient, love is kind, it does not envy, it does not boast, it is not proud. It is not rude, it is not self-seeking, it is not easily angered, and it keeps no record of wrongs. I wanna read that one more time. Just, would you just let these words center you, come into you. We just invite the Holy Spirit to reveal these scriptures to you because this is how we should love one another. This then is how we should live. Say it one more time with me. Love is patient. Love is kind. It does not envy. It does not boast. It is not proud. It is not rude. It is not self-seeking. It is not easily angered and it keeps no record of wrongs. Can we just thank the Lord that he keeps no record of our wrongs today? Amen. Let's just uh, pray for the Lord. Father, we confess today that we've kept records. We confess today that we have kept records of wrongs. Father, we confess today that we've compared our lives to the lives of others and we have found you wanting. We have accused you of not blessing us as we deserve. So Father, would you forgive us today? Would you give us grace and mercy? Father, you have been generous to all of us. You have lavished us with grace and we receive it today. We don't have to earn it. We don't have to chase it. We don't have to run it down. Lord, you've actually come and poured it over us and we receive it today. We receive your grace. We receive your forgiveness that you so lavishly have poured out on our lives. So now we come to the table of the Lord to proclaim that you are good all the time and that you are enough. 
In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.